Alyssa, I know it's not your actual birthday, but it's your unbirthday, just like in the movie Alice in Wonderland. You make every day as special as you are. I'm thinking of you every hour that goes by. Where I'm at, I can't call every day. So just because I don't call, that doesn't mean that I don't miss you or think of you. It's hard for me to use the phone here because they don't give us much time. I love you so much and miss you more than you can ever imagine. Love always, mommy. My name is Lili Gonzalez and um, I uh, was born and raised here in South Central LA. I live in the community of Florence Firestone. I really enjoyed growing up here. I enjoyed taking the train and when it was raining and I forgot my umbrella to see somebody selling umbrellas or when it was hot and taking the train and seeing somebody selling raspados. I did understand that my community looked differently than others, but I really enjoyed it. I grew up with my dad primarily, and um, I have one sibling. He was raised with my mom. I also spent some time in the foster care system. Um, I was in a group home as a teenager. In high school, I was pregnant with um, my daughter Alyssa, my senior year of high school. I was arrested two days after my daughter's eighth birthday. And up until now, I didn't realize that she had trauma around her birthday because that's when we were separated. And I wasn't reunited with her until after her 10th birthday. I only saw my daughter once a week behind a glass for 30 minutes. That was my relationship with her, but I wrote to her every single day when I was in solitary confinement. So I met Lily um, when I got to county jail. I was gonna go take a little shower and like everyone's locked in. You're by yourself, you know, roaming around in solitary confinement. And then I'm just looking at the doors, just trying to see who looks normal. <laughs> so then I see Lily and she was like, you know, being a little creep going. Ch -ch. <laughs> and then I started talking to her and she was like, oh, from right here. And then I was like, yeah, my dad sells carburetors. And she's like, oh, my uncle does too. And we're both, yeah, that's how uh, we became chums. Um, when I was younger, my dad was very abusive to my mom. He physically beat, beat her pretty much every day. We lived uh, welfare, majority, like I, I worked and I helped out my mom to pay for bills. But we always stayed in like a one bedroom apartment and it was like four girls in one bed. So I was just partying. I was like, fuck it, you know, I'm not going to whatever. So I'm drinking, partying. Then I meet this guy. He was doing drugs, but I thought it was just like a little party scene on the weekend thing. One night I was just telling him about what I was like, why I was always so sad and all that stuff, right? And he was like, oh yeah, consoling me, right? And he's like, you know, just take a hit of this. And I was like, oh, I don't do drugs. That was it. It numbed everything. And I was hooked. That night, he was like trying to leave, and I was like, what are you doing? Why are you always leaving? We started driving up this little hill in the mountain, right? There was um, a shooting range there. And he was like, I'm gonna go break into the shooting range and steal guns. So I didn't wanna call anyone. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. There was no reception, only, only 911. And so I went along for the ride, and then I got six years for it. When, you know, I got my deal, I went to Chowchilla. I was there for a year. So yeah, you would just see people fighting over drugs, fighting over girlfriends, fighting over police officers. And then if you say something, then they're gonna come after you. You know, like, if you wanted something, you had to do something, you know? Like, I learned how to be a better criminal in there. 
than I ever was out here. That wasn't, but you know, like. So not only did this impact, this my separation, like impact my daughter, but also her family, right? Um, she was taken care of by her grandmother. And my daughter, she told me, she's like, mom, do you think that I didn't want to be like other kids on the weekends and go to the park and kick a ball? She's like, but I had to get up super early in the morning every Saturday to go visit dad and get up super early in the morning every Sunday to go visit you and be there for hours. And she was eight years old. So it's just so she can talk to me through a glass for two 15 minute intervals, right? And she would see me in an orange jumpsuit and I'd get handcuffed to and from the booth and hope that the phone would work so that I can talk to her. I came home and like many people that come home, I tried to get employment and I couldn't. I tried to be as under the radar as I could and I couldn't. I would fill out employment applications online and as soon as I would click that I had a felony conviction, the screen would freeze, it would go blank. Or when I would go on interviews and I would mention my background, I could right away tell by the interviewer's body language, by their response to me, and by the way that they would interact with me after I told them that, that this was a job that I was not gonna get. You know, after struggling like this for a while, I eventually opened up a shop on Etsy and I just started slanging accessories online from the comfort of my home. And that's how I survived for a while when I came home. Then after struggling with employment and navigating these different things, um, I eventually made my way to Homeboy Industries. That's really when um, my life started, my journey began. Homeboy Industries is a nonprofit organization in Los Angeles, California that's been around for over 40 years now. They provide hope, training, and support to formerly incarcerated and previously gang involved individuals, helping them redirect their lives and become contributing members to their communities. I've worked there for seven years now. This August, it was seven years. The first year I volunteered through a program called AmeriCorps, and I was hired on shortly after that year ended, and I've been there ever since. Myself and a coworker of mine, Luis Geraldo, we uh, started to create Pathways to College. We first went to students and said, hey, what, why did you stop going to college? And I think students were taken aback because a lot of times when we stop doing something, people usually say, well, what did you do, right? But instead we said, what was wrong with your campus that had you just stop going to school? And since then, you know, Pathways to College is a workshop series that continues to grow and change based on the needs of the students. So sometimes students would say, this is the issue I'm having, I feel like my school doesn't do this or it doesn't do that, or I feel like my professor doesn't understand my experience. And so we would learn from students and create workshops. During one of the workshops, I think it was about the CSU or somebody mentioned CSUN. And I mentioned that prior to my incarceration, um, I had gotten accepted to CSUN and I was there for like about a semester or two. That's when um, Brittany took that little nugget of information and um, really encouraged me and pushed me to reapply and continue that path. When I saw that I got accepted and like I grabbed my phone and like I ran out of the class and I remember I ran to Brittany and I was like, oh my God, I got accepted, I got accepted. You know, once that happened, I was still not sure of what this journey would look like. And um, a while later, I, I was moved from the position that I was doing and I was placed in the cafe to work with the shift from 4 a.m. to 11 a.m. doing prep work for the cafe. They had me back there chopping chilies and um, I was like, I can't, 4 a.m. to 11 a.m. shift, I'm a single parent, I have no support system, like I can't. This isn't, fuck this, I'm going to school, fuck these chilies.
When I came back to CSUN after my incarceration, I sat in the parking lot and I cried because I was facing a life sentence because I did think I was never going to come home. I remember being in my cell and looking out of my cell window and looking out to the 105 freeway and looking at traffic and wishing that I was sitting in traffic, wishing that I was running late somewhere, wishing that I was late on a bill, wishing anything but fighting for my freedom. So coming back in, I had to fight to get financial aid. I had to reapply to the university. I came back, I showed up to my first day of classes with no financial aid and no books and no idea how I was gonna navigate anything. I appealed financial aid's decision to deny me financial aid and I explained to them why I flunked out of college, essentially, was because of my incarceration and they told me that my story didn't sound believable. But that since they were wavering, they were gonna side on the side of the student, which was me. So it's like, I share with you why this happened to me, and you're telling me that you don't believe me when it's already so hard for me to even tell you? And why would I make this up? That was my welcoming into the university. So what inspired me to start Revolutionary Scholars was this movement that was happening, right, and was very much inspired by the work of Danny Murillo with Underground Scholars and inspired by the work of Project Rebound, which was started um, in the San Francisco Bay Area over 50 years ago by a formerly incarcerated professor with the goal of matriculating incarcerated students into Cal State San Francisco. I was connected to Johnny Cifra, whose brother is Steven Cifra and the co-founder of Underground Scholars at Berkeley. And Johnny um, so happened to be a communications student at Cal State Northridge. And we connected and we began to meet and started mobilizing and having these conversations on campus. We started Revolutionary Scholars with the goal of always bringing something, a uh, larger support network for students on campus in the hopes of you know, bringing Project Rebound that has been the goal, but also a place to have dialogue around these issues as well. Uh, my sister was attending at the time Cal State LA, and she got this email saying, hey, we need volunteers to help uh, formerly incarcerated students register for classes. So I started looking into it, right? Because I'm already going to CSUN, so I was like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. I was like, do they have something like this at CSUN? And then I start seeing this Lily Gonzalez, Lily Gonzalez picture, La Comadre. I was like, oh snap, it's Lily, right? And um, so then I become a stalker and I stalk her on Facebook and I hit her up. And then she told me, she's like, hey, I go to CSUN. I was like, isn't that a trip? I was like, we were in the same uh, county jail. We both went to prison. We both had the same attorney. And now we both go to the same school. I wish there was a revolutionary scholars when my sisters were going to school. Like I meet people that their siblings, their parents are incarcerated and they can talk to me, they can talk to anyone in that space and no one's going to judge them because they have similar experiences. And like I wish they had that because it's like you don't do the, your time alone. Your family does it. If they're there, they're there with you. And that's the... My biggest regret is putting all that on my sisters. I was able to understand the power of my lived experience because if you look at all formerly FI students across the state in California, and you see the brilliance and the work and what they contribute not only to this movement, but to those institutions, then you will see that it's, it's what they give to the university, not what the university gives to us. Yes, having a, that piece of paper is beneficial, right? It's nice to put that line on your resume, but at the end of the day, I found that these degrees, no matter how I stack them, 
at the end of the day, we're still gonna have these microaggressions, this systemic injustice, and all of these other additional barriers that lock people with um, conviction histories out of life opportunities. When you re-enter into society, you're on probation and you're on parole, or you're on parole. And these systems are meant to continue to trap people and to send them back to prison. They're set up to be almost impossible to succeed. We like to think of California as progressive, but California leads the nation in, in incarceration. And it's a system that I didn't think that I was gonna escape, but I did. And that's why I feel a huge responsibility to free the person next to me. Our freedom is directly connected to the next person's freedom, and I believe in that. After graduation, what I plan to do is get a job, try to connect, I don't know, with some organization to see if they, they'll help me build like a little a classroom or something where I can teach. I know my sister will be down to teach as well, like mentoring. If I'm able to teach someone, then that means I know my stuff and I'm helping out. Yeah, like it's win-win. I was depressed. I, I had all these issues that were going on that led to that point. And being incarcerated doesn't help. You become worse in there, you know, like don't judge someone based on their past. Look at them overcoming that past and pursuing something better, being better. There were many doors that were closed for me. There were many times where I was told no, but I persisted and I continued. And this system is designed to do just that. So tap into a, your community. There's a lot of us out there and push through. Thank you.